My name is Reverend Kara, and we are so glad to be together in worship here and the sanctuary and with those who join us on Zoom. My microphone is on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sort of. You'll see if you are um, coming in, you'll see that folks have on their t-shirts representing maybe a race that they did or a school that they went to or a team that they cheer for. This is the conclusion of our stewardship series called Leave It All on the Field, where we have been talking about the ways that we practice our faith, have parallels in training for and being part of sports as a team. And so today we remember that God makes one team out of a whole bunch of unlikely teammates and that we all come together to worship God and to be part of what God is doing in our church and through our church and well beyond into the world. So, so thank you for showing up to be part of the team today. Whether you meant to or not, you are here and we are so glad that you are with us. You'll see on the back of your bulletin that there's a lot going on in the life of our church. We are a part of the United Methodist Connection, offering responses to disasters that happen both um, locally, regionally, nationally, and all around the world. And so our service and outreach committee is uh, leading a project where we will put together hygiene kits. It's kind of like an assembly line situation, and we'll be doing that in a few weeks on November 17th. And in order to do that, we need to raise the money for the kits. And today is the last Sunday that we are collecting money for that. So take note of that. If you haven't been able to give already, you can indicate on a check or indicate on an online gift. That's, that's the project you are helping us to support. Today after worship, we will have a town hall meeting led by our board and there is lunch to entice you to come and join us. It'll be about an hour and you can come and hear from many leaders in our church about what has been going on in the life of our church and what we are gearing up for in the year to come. You'll lastly, you'll see that our youth group is cooking today for the shelter, the women's shelter and they are meeting in our kitchen at 3.30 p.m. to put together a taco bar. Suzanne is here, she heads up that, um, that effort, and so if you have ingredients to contribute or hands to help, come and join at 3.30 this afternoon. And we pray for all who will be serving meals at the Interfaith Women's Shelter for this coming week. We have seven teams from our church doing that, so a team a day, and for that we give thanks. I invite you now to rise in body or spirit as our liturgist Paul leads us in the call to worship. Good morning, church. I, now, you two follow in the lines that are in bold, and I read the part that's not in bold. As the rains pour from heaven, soaking the earth, that it may produce good things, so God pours love upon us, that we too may produce goodness, healing, and peace. We have been blessed with many gifts, talents, and resources. Come, you love life in this, in this world. Come, let us worship the one who partners with us in change-making. Praise be to God who has blessed us with abundance. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, What Gift Can We Bring? in the United Methodist Hymnal, hymnal page 87, or number 87.
part in this game with me or people who are older, it actually is an all hands on deck kind of experience as we seek to complete a special challenge. All right, we've got some takers. Where's my buddy Irene? There she is. Okay, we're gonna head to that first square over there in our board game. Have you ever played a board game before? Well, this is a game where as a whole team, hey friends, we are gonna try to start here on the green square and we're gonna attempt to make it all the way to the pink square or rectangle, you know, shapes. So the, the rule is we have to all move as a team and to get to the next square, we complete one of these challenges on my pieces of paper. And so if you think you can do the challenge, you raise your hand and you say, put me in coach, and you're gonna do the challenge for our team, okay? Our first challenge is a singing challenge. Can you sing a line of any song? If you can say, put me in coach. You can raise hands together if you wanna to sing it together. Do we have anyone who can say, put me in coach from our sanctuary? This is a tough beginning, huh? There is a choir behind me. Put me in coach. Put me in coach, thanks Ken. Sing us a song. Put me in coach, I'm ready to play today. Awesome, Ken did it for us, we can move to our blue square. Thanks Ken. All right team, we're coming to blue. Okay, this is an acting challenge. Can anyone get, up, get us to guess a word by acting it out? Can I show it to you? Can you say, put me in coach? Irene says, put me in coach. You're gonna to try to guess this word. Are you ready? Do it for the team, here we go. Swimming, she's got it, we're moving on. On to orange. We all get to go. We all get to go, it's a team. All right, this one, does anybody know the ABCs? Irene knows, put me in coach. Can we do it? Do you wanna do it with her, Charlotte? Okay, go ahead. Put me in coach. Irene says, put me in coach. Can you do the ABCs? A B C D E. H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y M Z. Incredible! We're moving on. Okay, this next challenge is a hopping challenge. The challenge to, is to see if you can hop from here to Miss Julie, who's sitting right there. Do you want to say, "Put me in, Coach"? Do you want to hop together? Okay. Miss Grace, do you want to hop with me? Do you want to hop with us, Charlotte? Okay, we're going to hop to Miss Julie. Ready? Put me in, coach. We did it. All right, we got purple. All right, then we're almost there. Can you come to the purple one? This is a trivia question. The trivia question is, what is the name of the book we read from in church every week. Put me in, coach, the Bible, she did it. She got us all the way to our pink square. Great work, team. Today in the um, service, we're gonna hear a story about people who needed someone to help them and there was one person who had the gifts and the position, she was queen and so she could help her people. And she said, put me in coach. And we remember that God gives us all special things that we know and that we know how to do, even no matter how old we are. And so we're all a part of the team. And so we're gonna practice saying, put me in coach. Can we say it on the count of three? This is our prayer. Dear God, one, two, three. Put me in coach, amen. 
Miss Christina is helping with Prime Prime today because Miss Cece is sick and Miss Grace is leading it. So you may go if you want with her or you can hang out with us and we're gonna keep praying. Thanks, Ken. Way to be part of the team, everybody. Oh, we're cleaning up the board game. As we move into a time of prayer, are there places in your life, in your family, in your neighborhood, or beyond that you would like to bring into this circle, into this space, so that we can be in prayer together? I stole all the microphones, so I'm going to have to bring them to you. Miss Kathy. Please keep my brother Chris Manning in prayer this week. Um, he had an allergic reaction to shellfish on Sunday and had to go to the hospital. Fortunately, he's home from the hospital, but he's got quite a bit of follow-up work to do and a lot of education, not only for him, but also for his wife and daughter. Thank you. Thank you for your brother. Can you say his first name one more time? Chris Manning. Are there any others? Please pray for Pat Leach from Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, he's a friend who had a chainsaw accident this past week and he's facing a long recovery. Thank you, Rich. Prayers for Pat in Massachusetts. Julie and then Linda. Okay, my friend Diana Mears will finally have her outpatient surgery on October 29th. Prayers for Diana for undergoing surgery. Linda. To pray for Joanna, who's now at the Villages at Rockville, would welcome visitors, is in a lot of pain, and having trouble doing PT, but she's needing lots of prayers of encouragement. So a telephone call, a visit, any of that would be great. Thank you, Linda. We pray for Joanna and with her, and we offer ourselves in whatever ways we are able to offer to let her know that she is not alone. I'd ask for prayers for a colleague, Lou, who suffered a massive heart attack while he was working in the hospital and is in critical condition in ICU. Prayers for Lou. Thank you, Rose. Whenever we come together in prayer, we recognize that there are things that people have spoken out loud, and there is much that remains quiet in our hearts, and we trust that God receives all of it that God hears us, knows us, and is with us. And so we come together knowing that we are offering prayers that have been named as well as those that are unspoken. Let us pray together. Loving God, you gather us here in this space where many have come before us seeking your healing, strength, and love. You know us, God. You understand who we are. You know what troubles and puzzles us, what makes us smile and what makes us sad. You listen to our questions and our prayers. You know the people we love, God, the people we struggle with, Sometimes we hurt others. Sometimes we hurt ourselves. So we bring our own hurt, asking for your healing. We bring the hurt we have caused others, asking for forgiveness. We hear the words of Jesus, words we can trust. Don't be afraid. I love you. Your sins are forgiven. I will be with you always. 
We receive your words in gratitude. And we pray that you would make us instruments of sharing those words and that love with all whose names have been named out loud today. We pray that your healing would come quickly with comfort and with an overflowing amount of compassion. We pray for places in our world that are torn by violence, by war, those we read about and those we don't even know of. We ask that your peace would come powerful and fresh. That your peace would be made real in the ways that we live our lives here today. God, as we seek to be your church, your followers, we pray that you would write the words you would have for us on our hearts. Let them take root in the way we live. We offer our prayers knowing we are privileged to be called your children, and so we pray together the Lord's Prayer using whatever words, whatever language are closest to our hearts. We say together as one church, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We're going to continue our prayers with the song, Lord, Listen to Your Children Praying. You can find it in the Faith We Sing, which is the paperback hymnal. witnesses from people who have experience in any sort of athletic endeavor sharing the connections between their sport and their faith. And so today we welcome Jerome Williams to give his witness, his testimony, and we are grateful. Good morning, church. Happy to be here and happy to be able to share with you today uh, my testimony. Um, Pastor Kara invited me to come speak on sports and my sport, and the question was asked, what does practice look like oh, for your sport? I don't know why. So the, uh, the question was, what, what does practice look like for your sport, and why is it important? I felt like this is a, a broad question, because throughout my career, it, it kind of jumped in stages of what it looked like. I played nine years in the NBA. I played for the Detroit Pistons, the Toronto Raptors, the Chicago Bulls, and the New York Knicks. 
In college, I played at Georgetown University. I played at Montgomery College, and I went to Magruder High School. I also went to Woods Academy and Redland Middle School. So I'm gonna start in middle school, and I'm gonna go all the way through to my first year in the pros. So in middle school, practice was about 45 minutes a day, two days a week. I had a lot of fun at practice. I enjoyed playing with my teammates. I enjoyed uh, getting out there and really, you know, showing what I could do. After school, I would come home, play at my local uh, neighborhood basketball court with my friends, challenging them to one-on-one -on -one games, and trying to defeat them. And I felt like I was, you know, the best in my neighborhood. In middle school, I tried out for the seventh grade basketball team, and I failed to make the team. Yeah. I got cut, similar to Michael Jordan, so I don't feel bad. And it was at that moment that I realized that I had some more work to do. I had some more practicing to do, uh, particularly my left hand. Left hand said, they said that my left hand wasn't as good as it needed to be to make the team. And so I proceeded to really, you know, go out of my way to make sure my left hand was strength. The next year I went to the Woods Academy and I made the team. The tryouts were about an hour and everybody that tried out made the team, which was good for me. The next year uh, I went to high school and made the ninth and 10th grade team. And then by my senior year, I was pretty much one of the best people on the team. But I had a new coach, his name was Dan Harbour. And on the first day of practice, I was about five minutes late. I had gotten home from school and I had some chores I had to do for my mom and dad took me a little too much time because I wasn't going as fast as I needed to go. And I got to practice five minutes late. When I got to practice, coach said, hey, why are you late for practice? I told him, hey, mom, dad had some things I had to do, take care of some chores. I'm sorry for being late, coach. He said, well, I accept your apology, but you're going to be suspended for the first two games. I said, two games? It's my senior year. I'm going to get suspended for two games for being five minutes late. So it really, uh, really hurt, really just, you know, it was devastating because, you know, I didn't want to miss any games. But it taught me a lesson, you know, don't be late for practice <laughs> for any reason because I was in control of uh, my speed and in which I was doing my chores. So I went on to thank Coach Harwood later on down the road. <laughs> Not then and then. So I, uh, I ended up going to junior college uh, out, of, out of high school after graduating from Bruder. I get to junior college and we have practice about two hours a day, four days a week. And that turned into a championship uh, for our regional Maryland State, which was great. We were state champions for the region. And it was a lot of hard work. The coach there was Coach Steve Hobson. And he did a great job preparing us uh, for the task. I then got recruited by many schools. Uh, I chose Georgetown University because I was, I was born at Georgetown University Hospital. So I figured I'd you know, go back to where I started. So I graduated and, and, and was able to uh, do well at Georgetown. Coach Thompson's practices were extremely difficult. They were uh, very painful. And they, they consisted of a lot of running, and playing defense, and really you know, being on top of every little detail, or else you might get yelled at, or even worse. But I didn't particularly like yelling anyway, so I tried to keep that to a minimum. So I tried to stay on, stay on point all the time. My teammate, roommate also was a future Hall of Famer by the name of Allen Iverson. So got a chance to really uh, 
rub elbows with him. And one of the things I made him practice was cleaning up his room. <laughs> so, and I, I, I'm allowed to say that because he told that to my son. He told my son that story. So it's a good thing. So shout out to Alan Iverson for allowing me to do that. But the one thing that we did in practice every day was, you know, go over the plays and go over the things we need to take care of on the court, preparing for the other teams in the Big East, which were very strong. And I realized in order to be able to help my team, I had to continue to, you know, practice my ball handling. So I used to dribble around practice, I mean, I'm sorry, I used to dribble around campus every day, all day. And that was just to strengthen up my left hand, my right hand. And really, I just didn't want to have to look down ever at the ball to see where the ball was because I was going up against the best competition in college basketball at that time, which were all future NBA players. And I ended up becoming a top uh, Big East player. I got all Big East honors. And then that's what led me to the NBA. So I know I only have three or four minutes, so I know I'm coming to the end. <laughs> Trust me, I could be up here for a long time if you really want to hear all these stories. But it's all about practice. And I get to the NBA, and I was drafted number 26 in the first round. It's a 1996 draft. You can look it up after church. It's probably one of the most famous drafts on the planet. And it was very tough to get into that draft. But I made it by the grace of God. I made it. And I get to the first practice. Practice is at 10 o'clock. So remembering what happened to me in high school, I said, well, I got to be early. So I show up probably about an hour early. Thought I was doing great. Get there, parking lot's full. And I arrive inside, and all my teammates are there and salute me. Hey, Rook, hey, Rook. Well, there was one particular player. He was a veteran. He was about 40 years old. He used to play for the Washington Bullets. We were the Bullets. His name was Rick Moore. He was also a fellow bad boy for the Detroit Pistons. And he pulled me to the side and asked me, Rook, why are you late? And I said, uh, doesn't practice start at 10? He said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm here an hour early. He said, yeah, you're late. And I said, well, what time do I need to be here? He said, well, you need to figure that out. So I said, oh, OK. So the next day, showed up for practice. Was there an hour and a half of Less cars in the parking lot. But a lot of my teammates were already there. So I come in, and Rick Moore meets me at the door. And he says, I said, look at him. I say, OK, how'd I do today? He said, you're only an hour and a half here early. I said, yeah, it's good, right? No, you're late. <laughs> I said, oh. Okay. okay, all right, no take. So the next day, show up to practice, two hours early. Less cars in the park, park. Three, three cars in the park, park. Oh, today, I'm on time today. Get inside. Rick Mahorn's there. Two of my other teammates. And I said, uh oh. I don't know, but today, good. Two hours before practice. Nah, Rick, you're late. Said, okay, I know what I must do. So the next day, I was there about three and a half hours early. There's nobody in the parking lot. I was the only one. I had to wait for the trainer to get there to open the door. He opens the door, he turns on the lights. I was like, I'm on time today. About five minutes later, Rick Warren shows up and he sees me there. And I look at him. I say, I, I know what you're going to say today. And he says, congratulations, bro. You're on time. And he said, if you do this for the rest of your career, you're going to have a long career. And Rick Mahorn almost played 17, 18 seasons in the NBA. He was very dedicated to the team. And what that taught me was, hey, you have a choice in life. You, know, you have a choice to really put forth extra effort do what you have to do or not. And when I got traded from the Detroit Pistons to the Toronto Raptors, the first thing I thought about was practice. Practice the next day. So when I 
was told they were going to send me a plane for me and my family to come to Toronto the next day. I, told, I asked the general manager, Glenn Grumwell, what time was practice? And he said, well, tomorrow's practice at 9 a.m., but you don't have to worry about that because you, know, you have a couple of days to get here. And I said, well, I'll be there tonight. So I commenced to drive four hours to Toronto through a, bl <laughs> through a blizzard. And I arrived about 3 a.m., and I was up at 7 a.m., so I could be in practice prior to my teammates getting there. So when my new teammates showed me, saw me show up two hours before practice, before any of them were in practice, they were pretty excited. They sent a message. The message was, I was serious about preparing. And that's what the Lord wants from all of us. He wants us to prepare. We don't know when that day comes, so you have to read your Bible, you have to do everything you can do to, you know, bring peace to the community, bring peace to your neighborhood, bring peace to each other, bring peace to your household. So I encourage everybody to just bring peace and make sure you practice, because practice leads to some big things. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you, Jerome. We will continue to receive your witness to let it soak in as we receive the gift of our choir presenting their anthem.
So uh, after listening to Jerome, I'm not sure I practiced enough for this. <laughs> uh, he was really inspirational as well as instructive. Um, so I chose for uh, the uh, scripture to, uh, for sentimental reasons, I chose to read from Hurlbut's story of the Bible for uh, young and old, for sentimental reasons. My name is Hurlbut, or Hurlbert. And, uh, but I also chose it for clarity uh, because he's writing for young and old. And so here's, um, it's about uh, chapter uh, four in the book of Esther. And uh, just uh, to give a little background to this chapter four, uh, Esther was Jewish, but she was uh, the queen of Persia and she had been chosen by uh, King uh, Ahasuerus to uh, be the queen because of her beauty. Uh, but uh, now Esther had lost her parents as a child. And so she was raised by her cousin Mordecai. And uh, Mordecai raised her as, as his daughter. But the thing about Mordecai was that he incensed one of the king's top princes by the name of Haman, because Mordecai wouldn't bow down in front of Haman because he didn't feel that it was compatible with his Jewish faith. So this, this enraged Haman. And so Haman went to King Ahasuerus and he persuaded the king to promulgate a law that all the Jews would be killed because allegedly they didn't follow the king's law. So this is where chapter four begins. And uh, I'll be reading from this Bible. And uh, just another point, it takes place in Susa. And Susa was the capital of Persia at that time, uh, after Babylon had previously been the capital. And the new capital was Susa. So, Okay, if I can find it here. Okay. The news of this terrible law to kill all the Jews came to Mordecai as it came to all the Jews in Susa. Mordecai tore his clothes, which was what people did when they were in deep grief, and he put on garments of sackcloths, and he covered his head with ashes, and he went forth in front of the palace, and he he cried a loud and bitter cry. And so uh, Queen Esther heard his cry, and she heard him and saw him out there in front of the palace. And she sent one of her servants, Hatag, to go to Mordecai and figure out just what was it that was upsetting him. So Hatag, uh, Mordecai told Hatag about the law in which Jews were supposed to be killed on a certain day, the 13th day of the 12th month. And he gave a copy of the law to, to Hatak to bring back to Queen Esther. And so he got back to, uh, Hatak went back to Queen Esther and Queen Esther heard this message uh, from Mordecai. And Mordecai was begging Esther to implore the king not to kill her own people. So this was what Esther said in her message back to Mordecai. It is the rule of the palace that if any man or woman shall go to the king in his own chamber without him being him or her being sent for, that person will be slain unless the king extends his golden scepter. And I haven't been called by the king in 30 days. So when Mordecai got this reply from Esther, he sent a word again to Esther, and this is what Mordecai said. Do not think that the king's, in the king's palace you're safe and that you're gonna escape the fate of your people. If you keep still and do nothing to save your people, God will surely save them in some other way, and you and your family will be destroyed. Who can tell whether God has not 
raised you up and given you your royal place for a time such as this. So that made Esther think twice, I guess. So her reply to Mordecai was, go bring together all the Jews in Susa and let them all pray for me, eating and drinking nothing for three days. And I and my maids in the palace will pray and fast at the same time. And then I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if it be God's will that I die trying to save my people, I will die. So when Mordecai heard these words from Esther, he was glad, for he felt sure that God would save his people. And in, and in the palace, Esther was praying with her servants, along with the Jews who were also playing in front of the palace. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our message today is a team effort. Our lay leader, Bob Dean, has so graciously, graciously agreed to come and do a sermon in dialogue with me and with some of our friends. So you may see in the bulletin just my name, but that's just because we didn't reprint the bulletin. Okay, Bob, you ready? Ready as I'm gonna be. Ready as I'm gonna be. <laughs> okay. We have spent the last four weeks in our Leave It All on the Field stewardship series talking about teamwork, pushing past our limits, and practice. We have heard some wonderful, some powerful witnesses from people in our congregation about how they practice their faith. And we've been reminded of the ways that Christ calls us to discipleship, to be part of something bigger than we are, and to give God's, our best to God's work in us and through us. The scripture we have chosen for today is the story of Esther, a story in the Old Testament. It's not, not old, okay. A story in the Old Testament around which the Jewish holiday of Purim is based. The story takes place in Susa, the capital of Persia. The, living in the empire ruled under King Perses and the people from lots of different backgrounds, including Jews. Now, King Perses fi fired his queen, Queen Vashidi, back in chapter one, and had a beauty pageant to find his new queen. And Esther, a Jewish person, was one. Meanwhile, as Paul let us know, there's an official in the king's court named Haman. Now, Haman has a massive ego and a terrible temper, and he hates Jewish people. So he hatches a plan to kill all the Jews in Persia. He pays off the king to kind of issue this blank check edict without specifying who he's killing, and the king just goes along with it. And so we have Queen Esther, a Jewish queen, married to a Persian king who just unwittingly said that Haman could kill all of the Jews in Persia. And in the scene that Paul read for us today in chapter 4, Esther's cousin Mordecai enlists her help. He sends a message to her in the palace saying, you've got to use your power with the king to stop the destruction of our people. Now Esther doesn't say yes right away. At first, she's kind of embarrassed on Mordecai's behalf. Here he is parading in front of the palace. When he finally gets her attention, Esther thinks that this just isn't the right time for her to go before the king. She thinks, maybe I'm not the right person. She's afraid that she doesn't have enough to offer. We too can feel like maybe coach should have put someone else in at such a critical time, or that we may have some gifts to offer, but now isn't the right time to offer them. There are ways that we are asked to give and to show up in our church that ask, that ask us to go out of our comfort zone. Esther saw Mordecai staging a public witness outside the king's gates. 
Her uncle was wearing only sackcloth and making a lot of noise. She tried to talk him out of it, to get him to put on some more clothes and stop making a scene. Often, our impulse is to steer clear of things that would make us stand out. Hey, Simon! Remember how our staff did that skit at Christmas Eve this last year where we were all angels and we got to wear halos and special wings? Well, I was thinking that this year we could go bigger in the costume department. And how about like a full on How the Grinch Stole Christmas costume for you? What do we think? Yes? Uh, I mean, uh, the, the rest of the staff look very awesome uh, last year. But I, I wouldn't want to steal the show or anything like that, you know? So I, I think I'm gonna pass on the costumes uh, oh, this year. Oh, come on, Simon, take one for the team. Yeah, no, 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 uh, costume just, uh, it's not my thing, you know? But have fun, though. Bye. So it happens around here, too. We can be reluctant to look foolish or vulnerable, and we might convince ourselves that we are just not the right person. We're afraid that we don't have what it takes and that someone else would be a much better pick. Think about a soccer player who is selected to take the penalty shot at the end of a game, or a runner asked to sub in as the anchor of a four-person relay. These athletes are selected because their coach and their team believe in them but can still take a lot of guts to get out there on the field. Hey, Bob and Kara. I love serving as liturgist coordinator. Sometimes, though, when I ask someone to serve as liturgist, they think that they wouldn't do a perfect job, so they say no. They seem to want to serve, but they're afraid of messing up and keep insisting that I should ask someone else to read the scriptures. That's so hard. How can we convince them that no one has to be perfect in order to serve? I can see their gifts, and I know the congregation can too. It's hard not to compare yourself to everyone else and conclude that you don't measure up. Hi, Kara and Bob. Our church's finances are looking promising. And so many people are actively pledging to the church. But I keep hearing from some people who feel like their gift is too small to give at all. If it's not a large percentage or not a large dollar amount compared to other people, is it worth giving? That sounds similar, or sounds like a similar problem to what Pamela was talking about with the liturgists. Just like Esther, we might think that we don't have we won't cut it in the big leagues. So how can we shy away from offering? Remember all those times as a kid choosing teams for gym class kickball? When we were afraid of not getting picked or of letting down the team at the last out? It's no wonder that we carry with us some fear of being inadequate. But God's team, is infinitely more gracious than gym class kickball. That's a promise directly from God. You are on the team, no matter what you have or don't have, whether you participate on Zoom or in person, whether your gift is writing cards or praying or pulling weeds, or even if you don't know your gifts at this time, you are already chosen. And when we share the best of what we have, it's plenty. So where are we? We've tackled the hes hesitancy to stand out and the self-doubt or thinking that someone else would be better. The third way that Esther pushes back is by questioning the timing. We may know we have gifts to share, but we squirrel them away, perpetually waiting for some vague right time to bring them out. We know we're all busy people, and there is a lot vying for our attention and our resources. How do we slow down or spend enough quiet time to be aware of God's cues? Hey, Bob and Kara, I've been trying to find adult volunteers to help the youth group on Sunday evenings, and everyone I talk to says it's just not the right time for them to help. And trust me, I totally get that some seasons of life feel too busy and too full to add even one more thing. That's right. And it's good to remember that God is not asking us to spread ourselves so thin that we break. But, but at the same time, 
when I look at the kids who have been showing up all these last few weeks, even from the very little I can see of their lives right now, it is clear to me that now is the time God is calling us to this youth ministry. And if God is telling us that now is the time to go deeper into our ministry with youth, surely God is also nudging someone in our congregation to give up a couple hours of their month to make it possible, right? If God is calling our church to do something, God must be raising up leaders from right here, because if you, not you all, then who? And if not now, then when? God is working through us now. God is calling us into a relationship to deepen our faith and to serve our world. There are hard and hopeful things happening every day. And this is a community where we can learn and grow and worship and serve together. All throughout this last year, there have been people who offer their very unique gifts for such a time as this. Maybe they question whether their gift was enough or whether they might stand out too much, but they trusted God's timing and they came forward anyway. And looking back, God's timing was perfect. I think of Brandon starting a podcast for our church so that we could reach more listeners. Or the new people who have come to the choir or the Taze services. These quilts that are hanging here, like they were just made for this space. They were offered by one of our newest church members, Barbara, last Easter said, do you think the church might have a use for these quilts that I made? Like, absolutely, yes. What timing. What a beautiful offering. Or how at the last town hall, when Kara made what was a kind of a side comment about having helpers in the office, and Dan and Phyllis came right up, maybe about two months coming into our church, and raised their hands. And they have been there every Wednesday for months, for two hours, organizing and cleaning and offering their gifts. And have you noticed what's happened at coffee hour? Now it's become an embodiment of our wide and joyful welcome to everyone. Or how many new people there are on the shelter meal teams this week. We don't have to look far, and we definitely don't have to look in the distant past to find examples of people coming forward with their gifts, trusting God's timing and giving their all to the ministries of our church. Part of stewardship Part of being a team is recognizing how our different gifts fit together. We offer what we have in community. We listen to God and we listen to each other. And together in faith, we take it to the field and we give it all we've got. We are who we are and we have what we have for a time such as this. In the scripture, Mordecai calls Esther to remember that she is part of a community and that she has gifts and privileges and they were given to her not just for herself but for the welfare of God's people. He uses that line. Who knows, Esther? Maybe you were put here for just such a time as this. And Esther, even though she may not feel that she's ready, Even though she may still wish that God would pick someone else, even though she may be self-conscious or unsure, not yet perfect enough, Esther responds, Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. And so we respond as a congregation. Put me in, coach. There we go. We are so grateful to the team that comes together every week, not just in worship, but throughout the week in the ways that we serve and we grow and we teach and we learn. And so now is the time when we offer our gifts. You may have received a pledge card on your way in, or maybe you brought one from home. Maybe you have a special offering to share for Umcor this week or your regular offering for our church. We're going to bring our offerings forward today into this basket 
If that is not accessible to you, our ushers are happy to take them in a basket as well. But as we do that, we are celebrating what God is doing and has done and has promised to do in this next year. There will be a slideshow with photos of ministry in our church from the past year. We're grateful to Gwendolyn for putting that together and grateful for all of the hands and the gifts that have made this ministry possible. So thank you for your generosity.
invite you to join with me in a prayer of dedication. It was, um, the, the origins are unknown, but it was adapted for use by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So I invite us to pray together this prayer for vision and for using our gifts. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves. When our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we have sailed too close to shore. Disturb us, Lord. I invite you to rise in body or spirit. Our closing hymn is number 593, Here I Am, Lord.
Amen. Our choir has a special on-theme song benediction for us as we go out knowing that we are held by God, we are loved, and we are fully equipped to do the work that God has needed as a community in this place. And so our coach choir will remind us all we need is our heart. for lunch and for our town hall we will see you there in just a few minutes and as we go we know that we are going with the grace of God who created us and the love of Christ who saves us every day and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that binds us together and sends us out to be loved for the world we go in peace amen <laughs>